Siberia is not that harsh as it seems, at least this part where I live. Winters are long but pretty survivable thanks to the central heating mostly. In Russian there is a phrase uh, Siberian health, which means having a good and almost perfect health. But if to think, it's not quite true. Hey my friends, if you're new here, I'm Anna and this is my channel about everything that is mindful, minimalist and creative. Well, and Siberian, obviously. So today I want to share some insights about, about staying healthy in Siberia. I will share information about natural remedies that we use here and also the healthcare system. But I want to start with um, debunking myth about Siberian health. Starting from the 70s of the last century, a lot of people, young people, moved to Siberia and the north of Russia from the central re regions of the country, attracted by the romantic image of Siberia portrayed by Soviet mass media and promises of high salaries and different perks. At that time, Siberian natural resources began to be massively tapped. A lot of plants and factories were constructed and it contributed to and led to a huge a hugely bad ecological situation that we have to face now especially the low quality of water harsh climate conditions stress the body long winters contribute to long periods of seasonal depressions which most people try to numb with alcohol and the problem of uh, addiction is pretty huge here and together with the low mental health awareness it creates quite a not positive situation at all Although it's mostly true for the older generation, I can see that more and more younger people here choose healthy lifestyles, sport, hiking, fulfilling hobbies, etc. But there are some external factors that cannot be ignored or overcome somehow. According to statistics, almost half of women living in Siberia have certain chronic female health issues, and it's mostly due to cold winters. During my school and university years, it was not cool to wear a lot of layers of clothing, and once I remember it was minus 30 Celsius outside or even 40. Yeah, it was very, very cold. And at the bus stop, I saw a young woman wearing a short puffy coat and uh, short skirt and see-through, like sheer tights. And it was insane. And <laughs> I was almost like that. And honestly, uh, my health had a price to pay for that. And now I always put a lot of layers on and my winter parka, parka is always super long. For some extreme situations, I have my snowboarding pants that are more than 12 years old, but are still serving <laughs> their extreme function. Men usually neglect layering and I should say it doesn't serve them any good. Of course, layering and walking with all those layers on is pretty tiring and exhausting. And usually by the end of the long winter, we all are sick and tired of the leggings plus pants combination. Black Sky is not a horror movie title, but an official warning of a thick smog that accumulates in the city when there is no wind during winter months. Um, during the black sky regime, people are recommended to stay indoors, close the windows, keep them super tightly closed, or even leaving the city. But of course, no one follows these recommendations. At some nights, the fog or the smog <laughs> is so... Um, so thick and smelly that it's it's all it's very hard to even sleep and no one knows exactly what's in that fog i live in kuzbas which is a coal mining region and a lot of cities and towns in these regions 
often have gray and even black snow during the winters because, because of the coal dust. My hometown is lucky to enjoy a lot of whiteness throughout the, the winter. And I, I want to share with you one pretty famous anecdote that happened, really happened here. One federal level state official uh, was coming to one of the industrial coal mining cities here. And the night before his visit, all the streets where he was supposed to show up were covered with whitewash powder in order to hide the industrial grayness and blackness. So, yeah, no comments about this, this situation. Okay, uh, so let's move on to a more exciting topic. Honestly, I don't have any well-formed idea about why natural remedies are so widely spread here. Maybe it's due to the overall heritage and the ongoing practices of indigenous population here, or it's due to the strong connection to nature and the land of that, that people, all, all people have here. For example, my great great grandmother was a herbal heer, healer here in Siberia in a small village where my mother was originally from. Uh, family legend has it that uh, my great great grandmother had a handmade journal or book of various herbal treatment recipes and spells and after her death that book was somehow lost. So, I don't know, anyway, like, there are so many secrets in my family that I doubt that I will ever know the truth. Since I was a kid, we had three major natural remedies for the winter season in order to alleviate any cold symptoms. So, the first remedy was fur needle oil. We would put a generous amount of oil into the palm, then vigorously <laughs> rub it to the chest, put on a t-shirt, then seal everything with a shawl and then go to sleep. The second remedy is, was and still is, well, yeah, because I'm still using it, it's a potato steaming session. So every time we have bad cough or sinuses going crazy, we peel potatoes and then boil them. Then drain and have a steaming session with the head covered with a towel. The trick is to inhale as deep as you can, alternating breathing through the nose and through the mouth. I have no idea how, but it always works. And potatoes can be eaten after the steaming session, which makes it a pretty minimalist practice, right? So the third remedy is cranberries with honey. Cranberries are natural antibiotics and together with the soothing properties of honey, it makes this mix a perfect thing to enjoy during the winter. Raspberry jam and raspberry leaves are another very popular uh, remedies here, like natural remedies, but I personally prefer cranberries always because they are just super powerful. During the period of perestroika, when the Soviet Union began to collapse and within the first few years after the collapse, this country saw a massive rise of non-traditional healing practices. Um, we had three major mystic healers here in, in Russia uh, that even had their own TV shows and claimed to have healed millions of Soviets. I was a little kid, but I still remember how my mom and dad watched Anatoly Kaspirovsky on our old black and white uh, white TV set and they even placed a huge jar of water in front of the TV because Anatoly Kasparovsky, the healer, claimed that he charged that water with some healing energy in the result of the, of the session. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was the experience. And another two famous mystic healers were um, Alan Chumak and Juna. 
My mom even used some of Juno's techniques uh, to alleviate my migraines that I've been having since very early, early age. And I have no ideas whether those practices were legit or not. I haven't done any investigation. It's just interesting for me to consider those phenomena in the context of historical period. Overwhelmed with anxiety and having no firm ground under their feet, people resorted to anything that could give, give them any hope. And uh, it just seems like now the situation is repeating itself. My first acquaintance with yoga began with this book. And it's, it was written by a Bulgarian uh, yoga teacher. So I will show you some poses here. And it was translated into Russian and published here in my hometown by the local publishing house. It's insane. And it was published in, yeah, 1990. Yeah, you, I hope you can see it. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think this book was purchased by my mother. She was a lot into those non-traditional practices. And it was also she who introduced me to some elementary face massage and also shiatsu massage, which is a cool pressure massage. For example, like when you had sinuses problems, uh, you can just do the point <laughs> massage like a different. So th there is a whole technique. I, I won't show it, of course, like during this video. And also um, another thing that we always had at home was these, these things that now are called bed of nails, <laughs> very like um, non, not comforting <laughs> name <laughs> for the thing, or acupressure mats, I guess. Yeah, that's how they're called. And this one um, in particular is called Lapko acupressure mat. And whenever any family member had muscle pain or back pain or neck pain or headache or insomnia, this mat would be used. And again, I don't have any idea about proven and real efficiency of all those practices. It's just something that my family would use throughout many years here in Siberia. Healthcare is overall free here. You can even get free dental services like filling and cleaning. But those who can afford it prefer to go to privately owned clinics. And me too. So when I can afford it, I prefer to use those paid services in order to make sure that I don't have to redo anything. And also all kinds of surgeries and tests and even an IVF are free here mostly. But as I told in one of the previous videos, sometimes it's more uh, fast and convenient to go to privately owned clinics for that. For example, a couple of days ago, I underwent a regular ultrasound checkup for three areas of my body and I paid around $35 for everything. It's an average price for my CT. Last year, uh, I had to undergo a simple endoscopic surgery, and the only thing that I paid was for um, a more comfortable ward, for having only one ward mate instead of 10 <laughs> ward mates, which would be quite stressful for me as an introvert and AHSP. And it was like around $8 a night, and I spent overall five nights there at the hospital and everything else including the surgery itself all kinds of tests and medications and even hospital meals were for free 
But of course, there are certain issues here, like everywhere else. For example, in most situations, you have to know somebody from healthcare system in order, you know, to pull the right strings, if you know what I mean. A lot of public hospitals haven't seen renovation for quite a while. A lot of good specialists flee to big cities. And those who stay have to take up several jobs in several hospitals in order to make a decent living, just like my brother. And as a the result, they get, like those medical professionals get burned out and it results in very toxic attitudes and treatment towards the patients but of course it's not always the case and i've had very positive and also very negative experiences in the healthcare system here and also there is a um, practice of thanking your doctor for a successful treatment for example a patient or their relatives bring uh, the doctor um, some sweets or delicacies and it's considered very normal here it's a gesture of gratitude yeah and respect so it's pretty common various vitamins and supplements are widely available here but some high quality ones are pretty overpriced and for me a plant-based person who has to take like b12 d3 and other supplements regularly uh, is more convenient and cheaper to buy them for online from abroad than getting them in local pharmacy, so which is insane. Um, a lot of medications, most medications here are sold over the counter, which makes it pretty easy. Just not, we don't have to go to a specialist every time we need some special treatment. But on the other hand, it can be pretty dangerous because uh, many people prefer self-treatment and lack of knowledge and expertise can lead to some pretty sad consequences. I feel very grateful for what Siberia has given me in terms of being close to nature, being resilient and hopeful. And like many other people here, I cannot boast perfect health, but I'm doing my best to be mindful about it and to take care of myself in the best way possible and available right at the moment. So these are the major points that I wanted to touch upon in this video. If you have anything to add or to share, let's continue the discussion in the comment section. I'm always thrilled to read everything that you have to say and to respond. Yeah, thank you so much for watching the video till the end, my friends. You have a lovely day, stay safe and healthy, and I will see you soon. Пока-пока!